Hi there. And uh, well, yeah, it's a bit late for that already, but still, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2023. This is the first Octoprint on Air stream in this year, so I decided I would send you this uh, greeting and this wish, uh, regardless of whether we already have mid February or not. So, uh, and I need to make sure that I'm actually in focus here. <clears throat> Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome to the 41st uh, instance of Octoprint on Air. As always, I'm your host, Gina Heuske. Even in the new year, there's still no, uh, no B in that name. And I almost just said no S. Uh, well, wonderful. Yeah, uh, so uh, first of all, sorry for having to reschedule this from last week. Uh, yeah, last week was a bit of a mess. Um, pretty much every, everything that could go wrong went wrong, especially on Tuesday when I was scheduled to give a talk around afternoon. And during the morning, my internet completely cut out and that took hours. And I set myself an, a, a go or no go um, a, a appointment at 12. And uh, if it hadn't been back up, if it wasn't back up by 12, I, I um, yeah, figured out with my best friend that I would drive over to her and do the talk from there. And yeah, 12 came, no internet, so drive over. Obviously, I forgot most of what I had, uh, what I needed. So all my, my mic was still here and my headphones were still here. And yeah, uh, lots of fiddling, lots of uh, of uh, figuring out how to do um, the the talk from my from my laptop with borrowed equipment in the kitchen. Uh, but in the end, it worked out and I'm, I was so, so glad that I have these amazing friends. Then on the way back, yeah, traffic was horrible anyhow. And that was only one day. So um, I decided I was, I, I, yeah, come, come Wednesday, I then was also severely under the weather. So I decided on Thursday morning, okay, I think I should not be giving uh, any kind of public appearance today at all. So um, rescheduled and I think it was for the better. Funnily enough, I almost had to reschedule this one as well on very short notice. Uh, about five hours ago, I still was pondering whether I was able to do this or not, because I don't, I don't know if you remember, but sometime around number 46 or so, we had one uh, problem once already with, um, yeah, with tech problems due to uh, yeah, my mic not working properly, the camera not working properly, and it turns out they made an made a reappearance. So um, uh, and and got worse. In fact, so my whole USB subsystem was not properly work working today, neither on the laptop nor on the PC, and I've now rewired everything on last minute basically. And this is now the very first time that I'm doing these from my laptop. Uh, you do not want to know what horrible setup structure I have here, but. It works as far as I can tell, um, but yeah, you'll be the judge of that, I guess. So anyhow, I just hope everything will work. Everything will continue to uh, function as well as it does right now. And I also just noticed I should put my chair up a bit more. Um, yeah, it's the same mic as usual. It's the same camera as usual. It's just everything else that's swapped. Um, yeah. and. Yeah, I guess come the weekend, I'll have to rewire everything and try to debug this further, but not today. Um, okay, so as always, a quick short outline of what we are going to talk about today. I'll tell you what I've been up to ever since the last one of these, hmm, ever, ever since the last regular one of these, because the last one of these was number 50, which also coincided with Octoprint's 10th anniversary, which we celebrated there. Um, so yeah. Uh, Still, we will talk about what happened since then. Um, then uh, what will be the next steps? Then we'll have a quick look at the stats and then we have a Q&A segment. Uh, we only had one question left in the backlog, but as always, anyone who's watching this live can just ask more questions in the chat. I'll keep an eye on this and uh, do my best to answer them uh, live. Yeah. Okay, so what I've been up to. First of all, what I had was a vacation uh, over the holidays and frankly also sadly a burnout. Um, uh, I'm still recovering from the latter. The former was nice though. Uh, I um, yeah spent a lot of time on gaming, on sleeping, on spending time with my loved ones. There were some board games in there as well as some uh, jigsaw puzzle sessions. And I also got around to some tinkering and you might have seen uh, the custom Steam Deck buttons that I made for my uh, partner for our anniversary, which even made it uh, onto Hackaday. So that was 
quite a fun project that taught me a lot about resin and silicon and uh, whatnot and um, opened up uh, a ton of more possibilities for future tinkering projects. So, and I'm still not done with the whole button business either. So yeah. Anyhow, so the whole situation with, yeah, b between the years pre spending pretty much in complete and utter exhaustion state and yeah, coming this close to saying I, I'm, I'm going to drop the project, if I'm honest, um, made me rethink how I work. And I realized that the past three years, so basically ever since the pandemic started, um, I was mostly in reacting mode rather than acting mode. So um, maybe to explain, when the pandemic started, apparently a bunch of you got new printers and uh, got very, very much involved in using them, which is great because you primarily seem to have used them for uh, printing prote uh, personal protection and stuff. Um, it meant though that Octoprint's user base grew very fast in a very short time frame. Um, and um, that meant a lot more, uh, yeah, how should I say, maintenance overhead, support overhead, all of that stuff. And while the absolutely amazing community was able to um, how to, how to say, was was able to, to uh, carry a lot of that. A bunch of that still landed on top of my shoulders. And that meant that, yeah, reacting, reacting, reacting. Every day, just opening the mailbox, looking at what was up, trying to put out fires, trying to handle questions, trying to answer, uh, prob uh, yeah, trying to handle problems and trying to answer questions that, that way around. Um, implementing, hastily implementing uh, workarounds for specific workflow problems, stuff like this. Then we also had this whole security run uh, last, yeah, let's say in, in Q3 of 2022, which had me do nothing but field security reports, which usually turned out to be way overstated and often completely and utterly wrong. But also, thankfully, the one or other was, oh, well, not thankfully, but yeah, the one or other was also ex actually valid and and then turned to also me writing fixes and testing fixes and then rolling out fixes and then realizing that I had introduced problems due to the fixes. And uh, yeah, so that was three months alone of 2022. And um, yeah, so the past three years have pretty much all been like that, though not thankfully not all of them like these three months. Um, but um, yeah, I guess that is probably the reason why everything has been feeling so utterly, utterly exhausted, exhaustive, exhaustive. Can something feel exhaustive? Has caused me so much exhaustion. Um, and uh, so I decided to try something new this year. Um, so what I'm doing this time or what I'm trying now and which I'm now the fourth week into, I think, is um, doing one week of action, one action week. Action weeks are weeks in which I tackle st tackle stuff that I want to do, stuff from the development backlog, uh, tooling, tech debt, um, things like that. So things that I want to do, that I need to focus on doing, uh, that take a bit of time and that are not something that I can just quickly do on the side or something like this. And um, that, actually yeah need some planning and need some foresight but are also if i'm honest fun to do yes re getting rid of tech debt can debt can be fun to do um and then one week of reaction so a reaction week which means pr reviews issue triage anything else that comes in uh maintenance release planning uh stuff like that uh, administration, whatever. So all these things that uh, constantly just want, yeah, constantly pile up, will get then worked on. Um, and I also might expand this approach later to more action weeks. Um, so something like two action weeks per one reaction week or something like that. I have to see how much productivity boost that gives me. And uh, also how well it works so that nothing gets um, lost that needs doing quickly. But so far, I have to say, it feels way more productive uh, 
just a, just just this week and and that 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 other week i'm going to talk about what i did in my two first action weeks uh soon um and uh, yeah but this is a is a is a, is a Basically, it's a test now. Let's see an experiment uh, to see how, how that works, if it works. But so far, it looks promising. Um, and one thing is definitely clear. It cannot go on like it did the past three years. So uh, I need to get back in control of my own time and my own planning. So this is the thing that I decided to try to do this. And yeah, wish me luck. And don't hold it against me if your PR takes a week longer than usual for me to throw an eye on because it could just be that you filed it in an action week. Okay, so uh, after I got back from my vacation, uh, the first thing that I did was, uh, dig that I did was, um, uh, yeah, I also recently played through the dig again, but that is unrelated. Um, I, I took care of the backlog that accumulated during my vacation. So uh, there were some PRs that needed merging. Uh, and among that, those was also the migration of um, yes, that big PR from from uh, <laughs> Chris XD <laughs> um, that migrated the whole webcam integration in Octoprint into a plugin type, into a new plugin type. So what we now have or will have in Octoprint 1.9 is a new webcam plugin type that can offer snapshot end, endpoints, can offer streaming integrations, um, templates to embed a webcam stream into a web interface or into the web interface, and um, also some configuration uh, options to further configure the, the webcam uh, integration and all of that. And that will make it way more easier to adapt um, the whole webcam layer for new webcam types. So right now this class, the, 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 yeah, we will ship with a, with a classic webcam plugin that, or, or did we call it legacy? I think we called it legacy. I'm not entirely sure right now. Um, and that will, uh, pretty much just do what Octoprint already does. So it will, uh, have MJPEG streaming. It will have, um, what what all else did we have? Eight uh, HLS, uh, a beta implementation of WebRTC. Do we also have H two six four video tags? I'm not sure right now, but yeah. So basically, yeah. For most of you, everything should just behave like it did before. Where things change slightly is for plugin developers because uh, plugin developers who are accessing the webcam settings will now see deprecation warnings in the log because the they moved. Uh, they now moved into the compatibility layer of whatever is the currently default webcam plugin. And uh, yeah, that is something that will end up in the in the in the release notes, of course. And uh, with, with a big heads up as usual, but just as a warning, there is something coming your way if you're a plugin author who's accessing webcam settings or also anyone explaining stuff on the uh, webcam settings uh, uh, on the API. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing that I did was uh, there were some issues that were still in the backlog that needed fixing for 1.9. So there, for one, there was a redirect issue for the app keys plugin during the authorization flow when you not, were not locked in. So for example, uh, you fired up Cura, you told Cura uh, to please connect to your the Cura Octoprint plugin to please connect to your um, Octoprint instance, but for some reason your browser wasn't locked in. And then you could not log in, could not log into the um, into the the dialog that popped up. Um, if you then just logged into Octoprint through the usual stuff, you could still do this, but otherwise it wouldn't work. And that was, <laughs> yeah, due to a security fix that I did earlier, and I simply forgot about the uh, app keys plugin <laughs> in uh, with with regards to valid redirection URL. So that has been fixed. Then. Um, Something that has annoyed me in the past and apparently also has annoyed some people recently is that the plugin installation lock and the software update plugin lock uh, in the in the browser, if you copy pasted stuff out of that, it would not include new lines, uh, so line endings. So everything would just be end up in, end up in one line if you pasted it somewhere. That has been fixed as well. Um, 
Uh, then there were some broken links in the doc, some translation issues, stuff like this. So all of this has been tackled. And what I also did was I implemented some things that still needed implementing for 1.9. Um, so we can, there is now uh, the possibility to install plugins from a list of IDs or from the plugin export that has been in the plugin manager for a while now. Um, so you can just, uh, for example, you download the export from one instance and then you, you take that, that JSON file, that export JSON file and simply paste it into uh, the, uh, yeah, into the little um, file upload thing in the plugin manager. And uh, when you then try to install it, it will, de it will detect, oh, hey, that's an export and go over all of the plugins and install them for you. Uh, if it can resolve them. So, um, and that also works with a simple JSON list. I think it was a simple JSON list. I have to check that up. I need, still need to document that anyhow. So, <laughs> um, but uh, that also works with a simple list. So if, I don't know, you are uh, you are someone who wants to recommend all the plugins that have made your life easier with a specific printer type, you can now just throw them into a list and offer them to download on your blog or something like that. And then people can just install exactly those plugins that you have as well with one simple uh, from one simple file without having to go through the repository and uh, selecting them individually. Uh, yeah. And then there was also something, uh, yeah, some someone, can't even remember right now who opened the ticket, but there was an issue with uh, startup problems um, that uh, caused background requests, uh, that, was, that were caused by background requests that were stuck due to network issues and that were pulling down basically the whole web interface and um, so I added some more conservative timeouts there so that will hopefully no longer be that big of an issue and then um, I also spotted some problems with um, with the new webcam plugin stuff that needed some more love in order to be more backwards compatible so that has been taken care of as well then during my first Action Week project, I did something that I would consider tech debt resolution or cleanup or whatnot. And that is I migrated the whole end-to-end -end test suite from Cypress to Playwright. Why? Uh, and we, did we have an end-to-end -end test suite? Ooh, big surprise for many of you maybe. Um, so yes, we, we do have an end-to-end -end test suite that pretty much fires up some virtualized browsers and uh, remote controls them and checks if does a basic smoke test basically and that happens on every single octoprint build that happens on every single pull request that happens on every single uh, release um, and uh, it tests stuff like can i log in can i log out can i log in with remember me can i log in with uh, or rather can i not log in with a wrong uh, username a wrong password um, does the UI load without any errors? Can I connect to the virtual printer? Can I upload a file? And I think that was it right now. Oh, right. Also, can I open the settings? Can I close the settings through three uh, various options of closing the settings, clicking the X, clicking the close button and clicking outside of the settings. So stuff like this. Really just a very limited number of test cases for now, um, which is also be uh, uh, because the um, yeah writing these in Cypress was a bit of a mess. Um, and yeah, you had to do a lot of jumping through hoops in order for them to not be flaky. And especially over the past half a year or so now, we had huge issues with the stability of the end-to-end -end tests. Uh, they flaked out on every third or so build on GitHub Actions. Weirdly enough, never locally, so impossible to debug. Uh, very, very annoying. Um, the only thing that I knew about is that, uh, thanks to some monitoring that I was able to add, was that it was due to, for, for some reason, due to uh, the, the, the um, yeah, half of the static JavaScript files not loading properly in these cases, but that was something isolated to the Cypress run. So very, very weird. And um, yeah, so they were no longer reliable. And I actually told so configured them to no longer fail the build if they failed, because we had so many false positives with the build failed, the build failed, the build failed messages piling up in 
uh, the mailbox that yeah that was the only way to solve this uh, for now so um that is the reason why i decided to take a closer look at playwright when i fell over it roughly around the same time and it looked rather promising you can write tests in javascript which i decided on doing uh, in theory you could also have used, used python but actually the ecosystem in playwright is more tailored towards the javascript user uh, side of things so let's stick to that and um, the fun thing is that it took me only the better part of a day to migrate the tests over and then another day or so to to get the ci integration to work so uh, that was really nice and then i could even add some more tests that i was never able to get running under cypress um and yeah writing those tests i i yeah i spent half a day or so on writing test fixtures to make some stuff easier and uh, to yeah st something like uh, yeah, uh, run this test after having logged into Octoprint and having ensured that the website has loaded, stuff like this. And then it's just writing three more lines and you have tested a whole bunch of functionality without a lot of boiler code you have to do in uh, boilerplate code uh, you have to do at first. And uh, yeah, so the outcome of that is the tests now run faster. Uh, I think the Cypress run on CI pro uh, formally took something like six minutes or so, and now we were at three. Um, I'm not sure if we can always count on a 50% reduction, but it was still quite impressive to see. They run way more stable. I have so far seen no flakiness from them at all. The only time that they failed was when I actually broke something. Um, porting them was very, very smooth after adding some helpful fixtures and um, adding more now is very easy. So I'm thinking about uh, using another action week soon to um, uh, add some automation for, for, for some more sophisticated stuff, like maybe testing, stalling a plugin and uh, uh, checking that the update pop-ups work stuff like this. And I'm also now feeling way more confident that I might be able to fully automate the update tests uh, because those still involve me clicking a lot through the UI um, for six or seven update scenarios. So if I could automate that as well, it would be really nice. Um, yeah, and also every single test run now produces a very nice HTML report with traces and videos of the individual tests. And we test across two browsers, Firefox and Chrome. Before that, we only tested across one. So less time. More browsers, win-win. Or was it even three browsers? Might be I also added Safari into the mix. I'm not sure right now. Uh, and uh, yeah, what does that mean for the future? So we finally can rely on the end-to-end -end result tests, end-to-end uh, -end test results again, which is beautiful uh, because um, if we now have a PR that shows that the build broke, it no longer necessarily means that uh, it no longer can also mean, okay, maybe just the end-to-end -end test failed again and I now have to click on that and check that. And if so, just click on the rerun and then hope that now they are green and stuff. But now it just means, yes, something broke due to this PR and uh, yeah, hopefully the person who created the PR will then also be able to see why and fix it because the report will be downloadable as an artifact from the build that failed. And it will hopefully also be less unsettling for new contributors because we also had it a bunch of times that someone, I don't know, just com just contributed uh, some some documentation update or something like that, and then the build broke, and they were like, "Oh my God, no! What what did I do wrong?" And then we had to explain, "No, no, no! It's not you! It's it's not you! It's Cypress! Just ignore it!" And that was a bit embarrassing. And yeah, we do not want to scare off people, so um, yeah, definitely good. And then the second Action Week project, second Action Week is actually still running, um, is uh, re-ramping the camera support in Octopi. So uh, MJPEG Streamer, which is currently the webcam server that is on the Octopi image, has worked great for years, but to be frank, it was already pretty much abandoned when I adopted it 10 years ago. Um, 
And then it got some new life blown into it when the RPI cam showed up on the on the scene by Jackson Liam, who wrote the RPI uh, Raspberry Cam uh, input module for MJPEG Streamer, and also had this fork maintained ever since. But um, yeah, it doesn't support the V3 Pi cam, and actually the whole uh, Raspberry Pi ecosystem is now moving over to this lip camera stuff that they have apparently invented or something i don't know or at least helmed alongside uh, others I, I actually don't know about the history there but um yeah and the new pi cam only works with lip camera uh which is well okay um anyhow so um there is a mem an mjpeg streamer fork that does support the uh, that does support lip camera so aducam created uh, uh, an input module for lip camera and um, yeah, we briefly experimented with that, but mm, I don't know. The performance just wasn't there and it also proved to be a bit unstable. Uh, I tested it against a V3 cam and I tested it against an older version 1 cam. And with the version 1 cam, I regularly got crashes. So mm, not not to so just check faults. Very weird. Uh, not not to not to. Um, helpful and so i sat down with actually with weasel over a very very long day long uh, pair programming session and 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 brainstorming session and we um adapted camera streamer for octopi uh thanks to my customizer that was quite easily managed so i just wrote a new script that compiles uh, camera streamer installs a bunch of system D stuff and uh, that takes now care of detecting is there a USB webcam, is there a lip camera cap uh, webcam, um, fires up the, the streamer as needed. We also have multicam support so uh, you can just drop in multiple config files for multiple cameras where you say this path, this path and this path for USB cameras I should add and um, uh, a, a startup service will take care of reading those in and spawning the necessary uh, uh, yeah, camera streamer instances for you if the device is there, otherwise it won't start. And um, there's also some helper scripts available that allow you to add a new USB camera that is already connected to your device and you just, yeah, you basically just give it a name and the script then looks up a free port that configures and will also give you give you a little selection for you to to select the camera device so which it, which it will then also generate into a config for you that is stuff that we will need to uh, execute on the raspberry pi in the command line but still i think it is quite nice and in theory you could also write these config files by hand so um I'm currently still looking into stuff like hot plugging for individual USB devices so that that works as well. And I have an idea. I just didn't get around to doing that before this, before the stream. But yeah, I currently have a Raspberry Pi flashed with an Octopi 1.0 RC3 uh, customized or rather customized with a camera streamer included. And um, it's right now running three instances two USB cameras and one Raspberry Pi one cam. So it works and a very, very minimal um, uh, resource uh, consumption by that and snappy performance and all in all just really good. Uh, we also got in touch with the, uh, with the developer and uh, he also seems to be okay with us using that. So um the nice thing about all of this is that it's pretty much a drop-in replacement with regards to octoprints configuration because uh camera uh streamer will also offers the uh slash uh, question mark action equals stream and snapshot endpoints but uh i think i will also adjust octoprints configuration default configuration on this adjusted build and um yeah i hope that I will soon have an, an image for testing purposes up and I hope that a bunch of people can help in, in, in seeing if this really works. I, I mean, I threw it against three different pies here with three different camera configurations, but it's still good uh, 
to have some more feedback before we roll this out. In general, the idea is that once a guy uh, publishes Octopi 1.0.0, which yeah, originally he wanted to do this week, but then life happened. So I hope that we will soon see that. Um, uh, to to yeah to then shortly after this is pushed out to adjust the Octopi up to date build to swap out the camera server. So the, our goal is here to yeah have this ready two weeks or so post the Octopi 1.0 release. In theory, we could already just build an updated image based on the RC3 uh, image, but I do not want to yeah go ahead of Guy here. It's, I mean, Octopi, he is the maintainer of Octopi. He should decide when a release hits. Uh, yeah, hits. So um, that is the idea here. And uh, Paul just said, camera streamer has some package dependencies that aren't open source and have been removed from DB Ubuntu. That might be the case, but they are still there in Raspbian and they work fine in Raspbian. And I'm not saying that we are going to get married to this streamer package forever more, but right now it is the best in terms of support for the available hardware that people are asking us to somehow make work. And it has good performance. And it, I mean, it even comes with WebRTC support built in, but yeah, uh, uh, that still looks a bit shaky on its legs, but uh, yeah, even the MJPEG stuff is okay. And uh, the developer seems to be quite happy to collaborate as well. So um, yeah, I'm fine with that, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, in any case, very, very huge thanks to Weasel who took the took the time to do that with me because uh, yeah it was not, not only a very very productive pair programming session but it also was a ton of fun so thank you buddy and um, I think uh, we got something great out of that so yeah and the good thing is that all the work that went into the uh, yeah the hardware detection side and the uh, system D configuration stuff that is probably going to be reusable for pretty much any kind of streaming solution we throw at that in some way. So um, that looks good, I think. Yeah. So uh, what are the next steps? So I already said that as soon as 1.0 hits, I want to see this camera stuff um, also um, uh, <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> dry throat. Uh, I want to see this camera stuff also um, be launched quite fast because uh, yeah, we need Bullseye for that and the Octopi, Octopi 1.0 image will come with Bullseye. 018 is still Buster. Um, and um, apart from that, also of course finalizing 1.9, we finally need a release candidate for that as well. That is something that I will mostly take and tackle during the reaction weeks, however. Um, I started collecting the info for the change log. I want to push out the first RC ASAP. And uh, what I can only al already promise you due to these webcam changes, uh, not the webcam Octopi changes, but the webcam plugin changes in Octoprin, um, this RC will need a lot of testing from the community um, because uh, the changes might still affect some plugins out there, even though we did our best to um, make everything backward compatible and just add deprecation messages everywhere and compatibility layers and stuff. But um, yeah, it still would be better if it gets tested a lot. And uh, then I also had to do some internal refactoring to make uh, the Octoprint build process compatible to more modern Python tooling. And that could also have side effects on older systems that I currently cannot anticipate. Um, I hope not. Uh, the limit, uh, the, yeah, the 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 uh, support limits that I set. Um, so Octopi 017, I think, is the oldest that currently is supported, should work. But mm, definitely something that can also still go wrong and then will then need adaptation or workarounds or something. So, yeah, that is the thing. Something that still also needs to be done, of course, is the doc migration. That is rather something that will happen in action weeks. Uh, and yeah, so 
that is the current short-term plan. Paul said, wasn't passing judgment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just pointing it out as it will likely get greater adoption overall with Octopi integration. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I actually have to say I was a bit, I'm, I'm overall a bit sad at the webcam streaming situation because you've got a lot of solutions that focus on streaming, like moving pictures and stuff. And that is great, but if you also want to do time lapses, you need some kind to, uh, some some way to get snapshots. And that is something that is yeah kind of missing from a lot of implementations out there. And then you have the problem, of course, with this new lip camera stack that other implementations don't yet support. I think Ustreamer, for example, isn't yet lip camera ready, but I might be mistaken. I just looked at it and it didn't look like it was. So if there's something in the works or if it already is compatible and I just don't know it, then apologies. Um, but yeah, it didn't look like it. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's a bit of a mess, really. And yeah, for a long-term solution, maybe also with, yeah, I, I mean, long time, I, I would prefer if we could get away from MJPEG, but then it's also the thing that is most supported in all browsers and WebRTC is a whole mess on its own with all of the signaling service stuff. And yeah, it's a whole wormhole or rather a whole rabbit hole just to get a webcam server working with USB cameras and Pi cameras and whatever else people might also want to integrate possibly um, in a way that it doesn't bog down the Pi. It is also possible to get snapshot images that always work and are not sometimes just B frames or something. Um, yeah, it's tricky. I'm, yeah, I think we th certainly have our work cut for out for us. And uh, yeah, there's also some other stuff that will need to be looked into in, the, in terms of the larger ecosystem and uh, uh, operating environment, so to speak, soon. So yeah, lots of stuff to do. And uh, as Jim just pointed out correctly, yes, and that's also why the webcam, uh, why the webcam system was turned into a webcam plugin subsystem because that makes it way easier to just say, okay, for snapshots we are going to use this webcam server over here, but for streaming we are going to use this whatever RTSP embedment embedding thing that someone wrote, stuff like that. So that is the idea here. Okay. So, but these were my next steps. Now I'm going to switch you over real quick to my screen, which apparently works, hooray. Um, as I said, first time presenting on the laptop, I'm still surprised that stuff works. Um, yeah, so these are the public avail publicly available stats on data.octoprint.org. You can look at these yourself. Um, not much surprise there. Apart from this little thing here, which really confused me a bit, I have no idea what happened here, but first the number of Python 3 instances went down by 3k and then it went up by 5k within five days. It's weird. I have absolutely no explanation for that. If anyone has an explanation for that, please tell me. <laughs> I'm curious. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people sadly are still running Python 2. And I really hope that these 9% will finally see the light after now. Ooh, when was Python 2 deprecated? deprecated January 1st, 2020, I think. So we are now at three years plus. Admittedly, Octoprint only supported Python 3 from March 2020 onwards, but went Python 3 only in uh, August? No, not August, June, something like this. Well, 1.8. 
Um, it's, uh, yeah, so 9% are refusing to update. Whatever. Uh, server environments, yeah, primarily Linux users is always some FreeBSD free in there, but not much. Most of the people on 32-bit, again, not, I don't, st I still really don't see a lot of reason why I, why we should, why you should run Octoprint on a 64-bit system if you also can run it on a 32-bit system, because, I don't know, it's just a bit oversized, but yeah, okay. Um, browser, Chrome. Good thing we do end-to-end -end testing against Chrome because I use Firefox. <laughs> um, yeah, and operating system Windows. Most people are on a Raspberry Pi 3B, followed by a 4B, followed by a 3D+. Plus. Some people actually do have a 2.0 in works. And this is something that still really bothers me. This 1% here running it on a regular 0W, which never was supported because it is way underpowered thanks to having one single core that also has to do the Wi-Fi traffic. So, bad idea. But yeah, um, Octopi version. We already have almost 1,000 1.0.0 instances out there, which are probably either RC3, 2 or 1. Uh, I sadly have no information about which one. And yeah, Marlin still dominating. Okay, so these are the publicly available stats. Now look at some long-term stats. Or let's look at some long-term stats because I found this quite striking and I still have not fully figured out what is going on right now. Um, so I am currently seeing the biggest amount of users ever. Uh, or, or rather, uh, yeah, no, actually ever. Um, I remember that at the start of the pandemic, I was around 100,000 uh, number of total, no, total number of instances per 30 days. And now we are at 146,000 and we e even briefly came to 148,000. So there has been an, a quiet an influx this, hello, uh, this, this Halloween season, this holiday season, uh, which has been larger than the past. Uh, no idea why. But interesting. Oh, if we just, I think I have something of around two years of data, of long term data in here right now. It takes a bit to query. Sorry for that. Um, and yeah, here you see this was. Um, whoop. Why is it hanging now? Okay, the whole browser was still busy with thinking apparently. Uh, so. This was uh, last Christmas season, last ho holiday season. So usually the, the numbers peak a bit after, so during January. Uh, from my experience, we yeah we we still have the low, the the end point, someone here, that was Eastern 2021, that was uh, the start of 2022. So so let's say the holiday season 2022. And that was uh, 2021, sorry. And that was the holiday season 2022. And there it just went bonkers, like really steep. I have no idea why, but hey, hooray. Um, and Jim just said holiday season support volume didn't seem to be as bad as the past. Yeah, and that is also something that confuses me because there was a surprisingly low ticket volume during, the, during my vacation. And uh, also... I feel like it was less support overhead as well. And Jim just confirmed. So it's weird. We have more users. We have less support issues. Maybe the usability is improved. <laughs> um, yeah, but people are printing less. So we have more people printing less. What, what I always find funny though, is this little, this little on-ramp that starts uh, at the end of November so around uh, uh, Thanksgiving and goes precisely until the day before Christmas. Then people are with their family, then they have some more time to print and then the summer starts. And this time we had this little bump as well. So it started on uh, November 24th and then it went up, 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 up until 
December 23rd and then crashed until January 21st and then it normalized again. So I love this little this little seasonality that is in there. Kind of fun, really. Um, but yeah, more users, bit less printing. Uh, yeah, this is how the Python two versus three thing has developed. Uh, I think we went we we don't we. Uh, yeah, I've only logged this sadly since late twenty twenty one, and Python three only on Octoprint I think started somewhere here. So at least since then it seems to be rising. And yeah, Jim, gift printing precisely. I love that. It's it's always it, I've I've seen this in the stats ever since I started having stats, and I just adore it. There's also usually some activity before Halloween, though it is not as visible. Uh, but can we see it here? A bit. I mean, you see here is a bit of a rise. Oops. Here is Halloween. Then it flattens out again, then it rises for holidays, then it flattens out again. So, ah, I do not want to edit an annotation. Mm. And yeah, yeah, it could also be a Valentine's, a Valentine's Day uh, factor in here. Let me see, do we have anything here? Yeah, that also matches this bump. Look, here. We have, uh, it starts on uh, January 21st, it rises, 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 peaks on February 12th, 13th, and then goes down again for the, yeah, for the, for the, for the summer lull. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I find this kind of, I find this extremely fun to see uh, how, how stuff like this um, reflects in the stats. I also, oh yeah, you can actually really see it here. This is the this is the Valentine bump of 2022. This is the holiday bump of 2022. <laughs> this here is uh, did I say Valentine or Halloween? I hope I said Valentine. Um, this is probably yeah. This is just this is just help. Uh, it's 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 uh, the summer is over. Let's do something again. But yeah, Halloween. Valentine. Christmas. Valentine. Halloween. Christmas. Valentine. That's kind of cute. Um, but yeah, apparently Christmas seems to impact things more than Valentine. Uh, seems that most people are still going for the classics. Then again, Christmas is also something that is a bit more important, I think, in larger parts of the world. So I, yeah, it's it's gotten more more Valentine's Day has gotten more important, I think, over the years here in Germany because yeah, let's just say that the flower industry has happily adapted it, but um, it's certainly not. I, I remember times when it certainly was not that big of a thing here compared to what I saw in pop culture. So yeah. Uh, okay, so that was that. Uh, as I said, um, data.octoprint.org is something that everyone can access every time. These are things that live in my local Grafana instance, so you will not be able to see those, uh, but they are generated from the public exports that are available on data.octoprint.org slash, I think, export slash. So uh, I maybe should document that somehow so that people can find it more easily. Let me check if I said this correctly. It looks like it. Yeah. So these are all the JSON exports and you see they are gener get getting generated every hour uh, from the from the live tracking data for seven day spread and 30 day spread. So yeah. OK, uh, that brings us to the Q&A section. And as I said, I only had one question left in the backlog by John, who asked, have you noticed any dip or decrease in the number of users of Octoprint since Clipper and Voron came, out, uh, came, came on the scene? I feel like the community is growing fast and attracting more of the folks who were previously Octoprint power users. Has that had any impact of your uh, on your focus and the features you're focusing on? So 
Um, first of all, I honestly cannot see that I have seen any kind of dip or decrease in numbers because as we just saw, if anything... Um, uh, and now to the actual question here. Um, so with Octoprint, my focus is... All, all, yeah. With Oct what, what I want to do with Octoprint is I want to write something that most people out there can use. Uh, regardless of the printer that they own, regardless of the experience they already have, and regardless of the tech affinity that they have. So if someone doesn't want to learn how to write G-code scripts, then I would prefer if I do not force them to. Um, and that is... Yeah, that basically has been my whole approach to, to the whole thing for the past decade. And this is also what I intend to do, continue to do. And that doesn't mean that I don't care about power users at all, but they aren't like my focus or something like this. Um, and I know that some people have left Octoprint due to this because they want to use something that better tailors to, towards their needs of, 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 yeah, of, of tinker possibilities, of control, of speed, of whatnot. Um, and I've actually even had a handful of people complain to me that I was making things too easy for new 3D printer owners instead of pouring all my resources into power user features. And that is something that I have to say I found quite sad because, I mean, come on, we all started at some point. And uh, I think it's better to help bring people up to speed instead of trying to point at them and go ha ha so um yeah i i mean whatever people want to do they are free to do but please don't start gatekeeping like that um yeah and then uh what i also see is that uh, scott and the marlin team have made some huge jumps forward recently uh, so there's now input shaping and uh, a bunch of other stuff. And I'm really curious how that will impact firmware usage stats going forward, because um, I think, yeah, the number of Clipper, uh, of, of reported Clipper firmware has increased. I obviously can only count uh, the flipper, uh, the flipper, the clipper uh, firmware instances that I see connected to Octoprint. I I have no uh, uh, knowledge about the general usage, so uh, uh, that is a heavily skewed view here. Um, yeah, but I don't know, uh, considering how often I've heard that people are a bit overwhelmed with getting stuff to work with Clipper, having to flash. Uh, stuff that is not the usual firmware having to run a secondary thing and such. I don't know. It would be it, it will be interesting to see that now that Marling is catching up on the feature set, um, uh, how how that will turn out. And and can't live long also says I use Octoprint with Clipper on a Voron works perfectly fine. So yeah. Um, I mean, I also feel it necessary maybe to add that a lot of people th seem to think that Clipper and Octoprint are mutually exclusive. They are not. Octoprint is host software. Clipper is, hmm, yeah. In theory, it, it takes the place of the firmware of the printer. It, it also has a component on the host that Octoprint or whatever else then talks to, but it, it can perfectly well mutually coexist with Octoprint. So um, yeah, I know that some people prefer to use alternative front ends, uh, main cell fluid and so on. With Clipper, because they are tailored fully towards Clipper, they are pretty much Clipper exclusive, and that's fine. Do whatever you want. It's your, uh, it's your uh, printer, it's your hobby, or your job, or whatever. I'm not dictating anyone needs to use Octoprint, or else I do not want to be friends with them anymore, or something like that. Stupid. Really, just use whatever works best for you. Um, and. Yeah, with that being said, no, this has not had any impact on my focus or the few features that I'm focusing on. Um, I have the feeling that the way that I do things is okay and it works well for the majority of the community. Um, that I especially have helped people find a new hobby and grow with their new hobby. And frankly, what is rather making me currently rethink some of my priorities is, uh, yeah, stuff like the, the rather disruptive design that I'm seeing coming out of Bamboo Labs. So, um, 
let's ignore the licensing issues here. Um, but yeah, um, that is some hot and um, that is rather something that I worry a bit about maybe with, uh, with regards to the future of Octoprint in, in, in uh, facing stuff like this. But um, yeah, I, I don't see a reason to adapt what I do here yet. Um, apart from trying my best to not burn out on it and get more momentum going again, because this is frankly my biggest fear right now that I uh, don't. But yeah. Uh, Weasel also says that MPU's, uh, M MCU is getting crazy fast. Uh, if you know, if you remember correctly, the latest BTT SKR board got a 480 megahertz CPU. Oh, holy sh holy. Yeah, okay, that's fast. Yeah, I mean, yeah, eight bit. I mean, hmm. um, yeah. So if anything, stuff like the Bamboo Labs printers is making me want to really, really get get back on this on this com layer refactoring again. Action weeks, hooray! <laughs> maybe maybe two in a row at some point, um, because. Yeah, that would make it easy to adapt to stuff like that. If there is some kind of API that we can use, and Jim just said that word on the street is that they are using MQTT, so no problem. But uh, yeah, so that was that question. Um, are there any in the chat? Not as far as I can see right now. Okay, then let's wrap this up. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for being here. Sorry again for the reschedule. And whoo, we made it through a whole hour of this without any mishaps, even though this is on completely different hardware. And it worked fairly well actually and I see the CPU usage on the laptop spikes up to 22% on the on the PC is more like one um, but um, uh, but uh, I mean it works right so maybe I will just do them from the laptop in the future as well which of course raises the point why I do even have a PC anymore because uh, I I uh, yeah, I mean, gaming I do on the Steam Deck now <laughs> and everything else mostly on the laptop. So yeah, but video cutting is definitely something that I still want to do on the faster machine. Um, still a bit sad. Uh, Jim just said, we also figured out over your vacation, also over my vacation, uh, that the Anchor Make 3 is possible to integrate with Octoprint as well, but with a plug-in to fix their com implementation. Oh no, did they do something horrible again? Um, what do they, what protocol is that? Is this serial? Oh, I thought they were, had some network stuff going there. Also, what was the word on the street on the Anchor Make 3? The last thing I heard was like, let's, let's just describe it as utter, utter, utter disappointment, but uh, I might be misinformed. <laughs> waiting for the leg <laughs> and for for hopefully for an answer special end characters oh great yeah why why use whatever is the agreed upon standard when you can invent your own one which which X, xkcd was that again uh nine hundred and twenty seven 927. How standards proliferate. There are 14 competing standards. Ha! We need to develop a universal standard that covers everyone's use case. Yeah, there are now 15 competing standards. Yeah, final word. Um, okay, as I said, wrapping this up. So thanks for being here. Hope it was interesting, even though I rambled on, uh, on, on webcams most of the time, because yeah, that was a bit of a, of a major topic uh, the past couple of weeks. Um, 
yeah, then as always, I will schedule the next one of these within four to six weeks uh, in the hopes that no horrible, thing, no horrible things get in the way of stuff again. Um, and until then, I hope you all stay healthy and happy printing as always. Bye bye.